does for two. This session right after a heavy Mexican lunch, so please try to stay awake. <laughs> um, my name is Loretta Moody, and my co-presenter here is Maria Sarmento, and we're from Purdue University Global, um, Concord Law School. We're a fully online law school and have been for the last 25 plus years. Um, and our presentation is about student engagement and how that has shifted, particularly, well, for many of you since the pandemic, but for us for the last 25 years. So um, we'll get started with that. So as many of you are probably are, are brick and mortar law schools, um, everyone shifted with respect to being online and why the shift. Obviously, online law, online law schools, as I mentioned, is not new to Concord because we just celebrated our 25th um, anniversary this year. But with the coronavirus pandemic, every law school transitioned pretty much, right? Um, every law school had to pivot. Um, the ABA made an unprecedented announcement, right? Every law school could teach online, whereas before, it's, I think only a handful of your courses could be taught online. Um, so now, schools had to think, figure out what to do. What, how do we engage with these students? How do we still um, have students interact with faculty, with each other? Um, and they had to quickly switch gears and figure out how to reach and teach to adult students, adult online students. Right. So basically, law schools became like many other graduate programs who also have been online for many years. As we all know, legal education is a little slow. Right. Um, but law schools need to contemplate how to serve students in an online setting and also address some of the concerns associated with online settings, which is retention and um, persistence rate. Attrition rates of online students is almost six, seven, seven times higher in online programs than in traditional brick and mortar programs. And it's estimated that 50% of all online graduates leave their programs prior to, gradu prior to graduating. So even if you work in a tr traditional brick and mortar setting, you probably engage with students extensively via email, um, you know, they may drop in, um, maybe even on social media. Um, in this presentation, we'll be discussing a little bit of the ways that we've been leveraging social uh, third-party tools to engage students um, from the beginning of their legal education, from admissions until graduation. So just because we don't see our students in an office or in the atrium um, doesn't mean that we are not intentional or that we can't be intentional about student engagement. In fact, we need to be even more so. And as I'm sure all of you all know now, post-pandemic, we need to be even more intentional with engagement. So I was working on this presentation, and I was thinking of, well, sort of made me think about a store that was in my neighborhood that would always have, um, if someone passed away in the community or that worked at this particular store, it would have the name of the person on um, their billboard and their date of birth with a dash and then the date of their death. And at the bottom of the, the um, uh, memorial, it will always say, it's the dash that counts. And that always stuck with me. Right? It stuck with me because it's the dash that counts when we have students. Right? It's not the moment when they enter into our law school. That's important. And certainly not the moment when they graduate. That's important. But it's what we do in between, right? Students remember Professor so-and-so, how he or she made them feel. They really sat down and explained to them um, you know, the rules against perpetuity, which no one ever did. Um, or they remember Dean so-and-so, right? That's what they remember. It's those moments that are in between enrollment and graduation is the dash that counts. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about student engagement. What are we doing from the moment we get our students in the door to the moment they leave us? And really, 
we can also be talking about alum alumni engagement as well. We're going to focus on students. That being said, what do we do to assist students from the moment they enter our schools is extremely important, and it requires us to be intentional in our efforts. Um, in an adult learning setting, it's particularly important um, because students are aware and research supports that uh, uh, online adult students are more aware and are more likely to engage if they uh, sense this or actual academic benefit to them. They're not just coming to an event just because. Um, our presentation will highlight a few of the initiatives that we've implemented at Concord Law School where we've been intentional in our efforts to in programming design with the use of technology. First, our admission efforts um, are much like traditional schools. We, you know, we have an admissions team. We reach out to students via kind of their traditional methods, but also via social media, phone calls, and self um, and use like that. But we also reach out to students who admitted through a robust online program, which we call it's called Fundamentals, um, and it's designed to provide students with an overview of law school and create space where they can start to begin to know each other, again, to make this kind of universe um, seem a little bit smaller. And second, we also um, are intentional in our institutional efforts. Uh, we offer students several opportunities throughout their four years. It's a part-time program, so it's a four-year program to get assistance from professors, either individually or as a group. Um, and we have created various student, student gathering spaces, online gathering spaces, where students can again create the community that online students need in order to fill, um, in order to assist with this, uh, persistence. Finally, we also very intentional with our peer engagement. And when that's another, another area that we are extremely um, purposeful in creating because we realize that students oftentimes check out if they feel alone, right? So we, we're creating spaces where they are able to um, get to know each other, form study groups, um, and our presentation will discuss some of the ways in which we, we um, facilitate, facilitate those um, spaces. So first, the FLEX program. Well, it's a new initiative we're starting this year um, again, when students start to the, the beginning part of their academic career, um, we're creating the FLEX, flex program. So, you know, many of us, probably all of us in this law room have gone to law school, and a lot of times law school is, um, referred to as a, a foreign, visiting like you're visiting a foreign country. Um, and a lot of times students don't know the language, they don't know who to ask um, for help, um, which is, um, imagine being in a foreign country in the metaverse, right? And we are all little avatars, but we're not, right? But uh, an online setting can seem like that. Students, not only are they learning something very new, but they're doing it alone, right? With, uh, oftentimes, where they feel as if they're alone. And our job, particularly as administrators in an online school, is to make it so that they're not alone, that they know that just like if they were at a brick and mortar, there's opportunities for them to, uh, to ask for help, to get assistance in, in being acclimated to this new land. Um, so we're creating a program called FLEX, um, Fund Foundations of Legal Excellence. And the program is going to be for students who come in with low indicators um, that may indicate that they may not be as successful in their, their first year. And another thing about online students, particularly in our program, is that our students are older um, many of them are mid-career professionals or they're transitioning into another career. So there's also um, the gap of having been out of school for a while. So they need to have some bolster, a boost in their skills. So this program is designed to give them that. Again, it's fully online. It's free. 
and it will be credit bearing because again, these are students who are looking for a tangible benefit. It's not just the cost, but it's how, how is this going to help um, or benefit me on, in my, my, um, my schooling. All right, so there will be um, faculty interaction. We'll be teaching, uh, introducing students to, of course, legal analysis skills, um, ability to um, meet with other students, to start the, that community which is really what a lot of times students in online settings, not just in law school, but in other online graduate programs often complain about is feeling alone. And to the extent that we can, we are very intentional about creating spaces where students know they are not alone. This is an online space, yes, but there's somebody, which, you know, I was speaking to a student a while ago, like, oh, I met someone who literally lives like a mile from me. So, it's a space where students can start to figure out, well, okay, there's 10 or other people who might live near my, um, you know, within my zip code. So it's a space where they can start to, to meet each other. Um, we also involve our career services. Um, we have a dedicated advisory program. And in this program, the FLEX program, students will have an opportunity to meet all of those different departments and foundational support so they can be successful upon starting their first year. Again, brick and mortar, they can literally go to the various departments. And online, we need to be a little bit more strategic and intentional in creating those spaces for them. And that's what we're doing um, in the FLEX program, our pre-admission program. Maria is going to talk about the fundamentals program, which is the extension of that. OK, so um, our I just want to say I am heavily pregnant, so if you hear really loud breathing, that's okay. <laughs> um, so our Fundamentals 1 is part of our first year experience initiative, so it's really designed to prepare students and provide a glimpse into law school experience and the tools and systems that they're going to need at Concord Law School. So our new students at Concord are enrolled and even given an early access before their first semester even begins. Um, it's asynchronous, so we use Brightspace, similar to Blackboard Canvas, as our platform, and students are able to participate in discussions. We have integrated videos from our faculty regarding introduction to the courses that they're going to learn in their first year. Um, and then the skills that they would need, we also have live seminar options. Um, and this is just to provide them with the extra preparation for their first year. As Laura said, many of our students have been out of school for many, many years, and this is all very new to them. So the Fundamentals 1 course is really, it's a non-credited course, but it's just like an extra resource for them to take. Um, and then I'll just go over the different tech tools that we use. So I've been working in higher education and student affairs for about 10 years. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a librarian, so I don't have a background in that, but I do have a background in advising um, and student engagement. So high impact practices are educational practices <coughs> that's proven to be very effective in student retention, persistence, uh, perseverance towards graduation, especially for at risk and diverse students. Since most of our students are adult students, they're probably will be at risk because of the, the gap in schooling. Um, and as we know, first year experience is a hip approach and have been popular in brick and mortar institutions. However, it's very challenging to replicate in an online setting, especially that academic and social engagement. But for Concord, first year experience is very critical because we have adult students. Um, and in order to bridge that gap, we employ a variety of practices that's on the presentation um, to increase engagement, persistence, and retention. So we have a dedicated academic support professor who's solely designated to provide that support, that specialized support in law education. So he meets with students to review assignments, get assistance with time management, provide tips on calibration, essay writing, and it's very simple, we make it uh, very simple to meet with him. We send out a Google form. We embed his information on all our student-facing website. And then students can make 
an appointment based on their convenience. So in addition to uh, individual meetings, we also offer via Zoom every other week uh, an academic support webinar. Um, and he holds it with a small group of students. So he, the topics range from learning strategies to strategies for taking multiple choice questions, essay exams, and all our webinars um, are recorded and available to students to review later. We also have the Fundamentals 2 course, which is slightly different from our Fundamentals 1. Um, these are for students who made it past their first semester, but didn't quite make the cumulative GPA requirement. So essentially, these students will be are on probation. So we're creating a Brightspace course, specifically targeting them and giving them that extra tool to persist to their next semester. So it's really designed to reintroduce and reinforce the academic skills to help students uh, persist to the next semester, but also have that int intentional reflection with their goals, um, hone in on their growth mindset. So, so there's a lot of research out there that says that student institutions can positively impact a student's retention um, by taking on more responsibility in their retention efforts through comprehensive programming. So effective programming includes workshops, seminars, credit, non-credit classes that cover study skills, program requirements, and meaningful reflections that emphasizes in addressing their extra academic concerns that they may not address on the daily. So this is just our proactive approach to addressing the needs of our at-risk students. It's multimodal, non-credited, um, it's just an extra tool. There's videos and selected topics, and we've also integrated readings. Um, students will also be given reflection and self-assessment exercises, and it will include an opportunity to meet with small groups to reflect, um, and live seminars with their instructors. And since this is CaliCon, we would be remiss if we didn't mention our Cali exercises that we've been integrated uh, in all our course assignments. And we always encourage students to use Cali to review and re reinforce materials that's covered in their courses. Um, have you ever, have you guys ever used Cultura before? So um, our faculty loves Cultura. So Cultura is a video cloud platform for editing, embedding, um, publishing videos that's easy to use and secure. Our faculty, since we are online, use Cultura to make introductory video messages. Um, and instead of written feedbacks, they actually use Cultura to provide video feedbacks, um, just so students can witness the emphasis on certain concerns. Our instructor has more freedom to dive deeper um, and be more detailed and kind of refer back to previous comments. Uh, and it's kind of like more of a discussion format, even though it's a one-way video. Um, and of course, we use Zoom and breakout rooms and poll everywhere. But we also use, too, I should say, um, YouTube. I do, YouTube yeah. videos as well. Um, yeah, so you use breakout rooms to obviously increase student engagement and help create that sense of community so students can get to know one another, even via online. Um, and as mentioned before, it's really important that institutions are intentional in their efforts to create engagement um, and increase in retention, and that should extend beyond the online classroom. Um, when students feel more of a comfort and familiarity with their instructors, the, the more likely they'll uh, actively participate, the less feeling of being isolated in an online education environment. So we actually created this initiative called Water Cooler Chats. So this is really just to increase that faculty-student uh, relationship. So every month we host it via Zoom or Google Meets, and we invite a faculty member to come and students to come. So it's a small group, usually around 10 to 20 students, um, and a student-driven conversation. So it basically the students choose whatever topic they want to discuss. Um, I would say this is probably a very 
one of the most successful initiatives that we have. Since we only have like 10 to 20 people that's invited, there's usually more students than slots that we have. And also it's because it's very informal. Um, lastly, uh, we also have a, a Google site that's dedicated for all our student or academic resources. One of the biggest factors for students dropping out from an online education is that they don't know where to get assistance or how to get assistance. Um, so our goal was to, to create this page, kind of like a one-stop shop uh, for students to access information that's readily available uh, and always accessible. So peer support, there's even more of an emphasis in peer support in online education just because once again, most of our students are adult students, non-digital natives who can benefit from peer guidance, which reflects um, most of the students at Concord. Have you guys used Cranium through Connects Ed? So Cranium is a collaborative platform. We use it as a tutoring and student support service. So we have upper class peer mentors who are also part of our Student Bar Association eBoard. So some specialize in new and incoming students and helping them adapt into the new environment, and some specialize in their first and second year courses. And Cranium is pretty easy to use. It's kind of like you can book me where students can go in just meeting an appointment with a peer mentor. Get Set is something very new to us, but it's actually highly used by our law students. And um, I should say that Cranium and Get Set, they're PG Purdue global platform, so they're used university wide, but um, obviously as a part of Purdue Global, our students are able to use any resources with it, Purdue. And um, Get Set and Cranium are really geared towards students who are online because they can connect from anywhere. So yeah, um, I see Get Set kind of a more Reddit forum, but more professional and academic setting. Um, so students can post topics they want to discuss. Other students can connect with them, either privately or publicly. It's also used as a journaling site and collaboration site. Um, so it's just a site to allow students to share stories, tips, advice, and words of encouragement. Uh, student groups. So although we're online, we still want students to benefit from student involvement. Because we don't have an actual classroom for meetings, we actually use Brightspace Classroom to hold our Student Bar Association. Uh, and it's, they can post announcements, discuss general law school concerns, invite peers to our regional meetings, um, and so on. And we like to create and promote and hold our student-led initiatives, like our Wellness Week, during finals in, Crania, in uh, Brightspace. And lastly, social media, of course. Uh, researchers suggest that online social networks have shown to supplement and actually increase the face-to-face -face social connections. So we use Facebook and LinkedIn uh, as just common tools to boost peer engagement, increase access to resources, and build students' social capital. If our uh, older adult students decide to use TikTok more, we'll jump on that and create some dances to get them. <laughs> and I, I want to just add to it, I don't know if any of you all are um, student advisors or student groups. I know I was when I was in a brick and mortar. Um, and at the time, we didn't have some of these technological tools when I was doing that. But if you are, you may want to think about maybe setting up a dedicated um, whatever learning management platform you use um, for that student group, because it is really helpful for them to engage. Um, Kind of ongoing and I know sometimes student groups some are more active than others other tools I've, I've recommended um, and used recently is group me um, which is a kind of like slack or it's a dedicated um, what is it texting thing you know um, it's just for your group and you can enroll students via your institution or you can just set up those students can set up individually but those are some tools that um, I found helpful um, and students can also use in, as a group, if they are a part of a student group, to just have ongoing communication. Particularly if you're a student advisor, you may want to suggest that for them to um, 
to just have a better ease of communicating with each other. And finally, we want to just kind of give a, a visual of some of the various tools that we use um, through our, our, throughout our programming out of Sakali. Um, Zoom, huge major player, which I had stock in at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, you know, Kaltura and other type of um, screen sharing and video making platforms. Um, gets that cranium, pull everywhere. I know one of the previous presenters said she doesn't care for it. I do like raising hands, but pull everywhere is really helpful too if you want to capture that data and keep it and um, you know look at it perhaps a little, a little later on. Obviously Google Meet, um, we use extensively. Uh, Google has a, a Google Suite has a host of, as you all probably know, of, of tools that you can use um, for engaging with students and just to kind of make your lives easier, period. Um, so what we wanted to do, because we want to know what you do and what tools you all use, we have just a, another little tech tool um, to hear from you. So if you don't mind, if you can go to www.menti.com, like Minty Fresh, and um, tell you the code to put in. So once you go to Minty.com, you can put in the code 85214221, and you should, if everything is working correctly, see that um, question and if you wouldn't mind typing in what are some tech tools that you use to engage students in class and as an institution. We'll use Minty. Great. <coughs> Minty Fresh. <laughs> Never heard of Yellow Dick. Well, okay, these are some really great ones. Um, Canva Zoom, Twin, Slack, yes. <clears throat> so a lot of great resources here. I'm seeing Minty um, and Canvas and Twin, Poll and the Zoom Flickr, yeah. So we're using a lot of the same things and hopefully they're working to engage students in class but you can also engage students outside of class with these same tools too. Um, in your student groups, um, individually, um, you know, if you're, you're meeting, you know, if you're a student advisor or what have you. So it's nice to just kind of see what other people are doing. So I'm gonna to go to the next question. <coughs> Should be able to just refresh and put the um, and answer this question as well. So, how, how often do you incorporate tech tools into your teaching operational practices? Once a week, a lot of once a week, several times a week. Not so many dailies, but once a week. Okay, once a week. Um, can anyone maybe expand on that for anyone who said once a week? How do you how do you all use technology within student engagement? Want to follow up with that a little bit? I only teach once a week. Oh, that's why. Okay, well, that makes sense. <laughs> what about someone daily? Is it just emailing students? Is that what you mean by daily, or is it using some other type of platform? There were five people who said daily. What do you do on a daily basis? <laughs> I can speak from our faculty at GW. They're using discussion boards. Discussion and they'll boards. have discussion threads throughout the week. Okay. And do students tend to like discussion boards? Because I know our students balk at them. They're like, oh. Uh, I would say for as long as the, you rate the questions and monitor it the proper way, then mm -hmm. yes, I think that that's the key. Okay. If they feel like it's busy work, then yes, they're going and, to And that's it. exactly right. If they feel like it's busy work, they don't particularly care for it. True. Yes. It also depends on the student. Um, if you're a student who's 
also depends on the course. So if I'm teaching a research class, we do use technology literally every week, but it would be Westlaw, Lexis, you know, govinfo.gov, things like that. So we're using an electronic resource at all times, but once a week. it's a different course once a right, week. Exactly. Sense, right, exactly. So it's dependent on the contents. Content. Yeah. Well, this was helpful. Did anyone have any other comments? Comment. Oh, yes. I was going to say that I'm not very familiar with Yellow Dig yet, but it is a tool for making discussion board stuff better and more gamified and more interactive. So oh. that might be worth looking at. I will definitely be writing it because I had never heard of Yellow Dig. But it's really interesting. Um, that's it for us. Um, we will have an opportunity for questions after the next presentation. So thank you all and um, let me clear this out. So my flight got in very, very late last night, so I missed the uh, uh, presenter. Am I are we supposed to wear? No, it'll pick it up unless they can't hear you. Okay, no gotcha. Great. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Larry Cunningham. I'm the Dean of Charleston School of Law. I'm also a Cali board member. Uh, it's very nice to, to be here, be with everyone. Um, I thought before I began, I uh, wanted to just say something from a, from a Dean perspective, which is that when you go to conferences like these and you see a presentation that you really liked, send an email to the dean of the presenter's school. Uh, we get a lot of um, nasty grams and unpleasant emails um, uh, and emails that raises pro raise problems. And so if we get something that says something nice about one of our, uh, one of our employees that really makes our day and then it allows us to let them know that they did something uh, impactful. So just a, just a suggestion. Um, so the, the title of my uh, presentation is uh, What Keeps Deans, Provosts, and Presidents Up uh, at Night? Uh, and uh, I've been dean of my school now for, uh, for three years. Uh, I thought I knew what the job was because I had been an associate dean uh, at another school for about 10 years. Uh, and I really had no idea about sort of the full gamut of things that can add stress to one's life uh, as a dean. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of a, a, a quick list. And it actually ties in a lot with the prior presentation because a lot of what keeps us up at night is enrollment. Uh, and at the undergraduate level, uh, you'll hear a lot of words like retention and persistence. We're fortunate at the law school level that once students enroll, they're probably going to go on to graduate at, at high rates. Exceptions, uh, if a student transfers out, if they're academically attrited, or they have some other personal reason, they just decide law school isn't uh, for them. But at the undergraduate level, retention rates 50, 60 percent, uh, 70 percent are not, not uncommon. Uh, you know, they very often measure graduation rates by six years, not four years. Uh, and what they consider very often a successful graduation rate uh, is to, I think, a lot of us very low. We don't have a lot of that issue in, uh, in law school. But enrollment at the beginning end is, is very important, particularly for most of our schools because we are uh, tuition dependent. And so if we don't meet those revenue goals, uh-oh, what do we do? We have, to, we have to balance the budget somehow. We can either cut expenses, we can dip into reserves. Um, Right now is a very nail-biting time of year for deans and admissions offices because we're waiting to see who is actually going to show up in our August classes uh, or who is going to get off the wait list of another school and wind up going there uh, instead. And so what, what I lie awake at night often thinking about is are we providing the value to students that will lead them to come to our 
our school. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a moment. Um, other things that keep me up, uh, HR issues. Um, uh, never any, any shortage of those. Uh, but if they are handled correctly, no one sh else should ever know about them except the dean and the HR uh, director. Um, I worry very much these days about losing staff, about losing uh, faculty, um, lawsuits and litigation. Uh, you know, now we're on the other side of, of the law in some, in some respects, uh, worrying about risk there. Uh, student protests, external protests, uh, for public schools, uh, political pressures. Uh, but in, in many respects, a lot of these are short-term or cyclical things that happen. And, and we have levers to deal with them. So if, for example, I had a shortfall in my August enrollment class, let's say I was 10 students short, we also have a January start class. So I could just make that up and, and I'll, I'll figure out a way to to balance uh, the books. But there are some real long-term challenges, but also opportunities that are ahead of us that I think about uh, a lot, uh, and that require a lot of forethought and, and planning. Um, and so I have eight of them, and I'll, I'll go through them, and then I want to talk about how it ties in with, with you all. Uh, everyone in the room is interested in technology and legal education in some form or fashion. And I think in many respects, technology uh, can help, uh, your use of technology can help uh, your deans very much. So uh, the first thing uh, that I think is a, a long-term challenge is something called the enrollment cliff. Uh, we've known for many years that there's a demographic shift in the country of sort of migration patterns of people away from the Northeast and towards the Southwest. The other thing we know is that people stopped having as many babies around 2008, 2009. Uh, it went down, down, down. 2013 started to, uh, to level off. Well, that's going to have implications starting around now for undergraduate institutions, if you fast forward 18 years. And then around 20, 29, 20, 30, perhaps for law schools. Uh, there's a really, really terrific book. Um, I got this through Interlibrary Loan, and I hope the Interlibrary Loan police don't come after me, but I'm going to take off the band. Uh, I'm just gasp. I'll put it back on. Uh, it's, uh, it's this book. Uh, it's, it's really, really uh, fantastic. It's called Demographics and the Demand. For Higher Education by Nathan Graw, G-R-A-W-E. That's Demographics and the Demand for uh, Higher Education. Uh, and he talks about, he goes through the empirical data on birth rates and demographic shifts and what it could mean for different uh, sectors of, uh, of higher education. Right, I don't want to rip it, so I'll put it on later. Um, so that's number one. The other the other thing that we know will happen is that applications to law school are cyclical. Um, they go up, they go down. A few years ago, we had a nice boost. It goes down, it goes up, and being prepared for that. Something else that's sort of big on the, the horizon, regulations and accreditation changes. Um, these affect a variety of, of sectors and cause, and cause disruption to how we're we're doing. There are also, this is number four, market disruptions, things sort of external going on, like the possibility that law schools might be able to go test optional. It looked like it was going to happen sooner rather than later. Now the ABA has tapped the brakes a bit on it, but that may be coming down the, the road. Uh, around the same time when we have a new bar exam, uh, just as we got used to the uniform bar exam, we have a new one on the horizon. We have a decision from the Supreme Court, expected any day now, that's likely to expect, uh, likely to disrupt some of the models and methods that we utilize for recruitment of students. Long term, uh, a lot of us worry about unexpected costs, lawsuits, facilities, emergencies. 
Uh, I mentioned an aging faculty and staff over the, the next 10, 20 years. There's going to be a great retirement. Do we have the people to replace them with? Uh, of interest to the room, uh, believe it or not, one of the things that I worry about a lot are IT security issues, particularly as dean of a standalone law school. I do not have a university structure to, uh, to rely on. I have a phenomenal IT director, we have IT consultants, but I worry about ransomware. I worry about attacks on our system. On the one hand, we've benefited in that respect by reliance on cloud-based solutions. So we're a fully Microsoft 365 school. We don't have email servers anymore. Um, our student information uh, system, Genzibar, is fully cloud-based. But one of my nightmares is that I'll wake up uh, in the morning, I'll go into the office, I'll log on to something, and I get 404 error website not found. That worries me uh, a, great, uh, a great deal. And then for state institutions, political interference is something that concerns me a great, great deal. So you all are, we all are interested in uh, technology. And so let me suggest some few ways that, uh, that you can help. And uh, the key for me is efficiency. How do we make better use of resources? And we give you some, some examples uh, of that. Uh, technology for me can be the, the solution to many problems. So thinking about COVID and Zoom. Could you imagine if we went through COVID 10 years prior and we didn't have Zoom or WebEx or anything like that? What would we do? I mean, conference call, conference bridge calls, have classes by telephone? I, I don't know what we would do. But we were fortunate that we had this technology and that those technology providers were able to ramp up in the way, uh, in the way that they did. So uh, a few examples of the way that I found technology to really help. Uh, first of all, with respect to marketing uh, and recruitment of students. We're doing some really neat stuff with uh, recruiting students where they are, which is online. Uh, so we have an app that we're using called ZMe, which is a community-based uh, app for, uh, for students. It's a way for them to uh, start getting connections with them early. Uh, and the idea is then that hopefully that they will, will yield at a, at a higher rate. Uh, we have found ways to work more efficiently, more efficiently as teams through, for example, Teams uh, or Zoom or project management software. Uh, we recently purchased a subscription to Calendly. Uh, anybody else use Calendly? Calendly eliminates the need for those back and forth emails to schedule meetings. You just send them, send a person a link, and it syncs with your calendar. You tell it when you want to block, block time off, and the student or whoever can just sign up for, uh, for a time uh, with you. Um, that was to address a, sort of a student issue of, oh, I'm having trouble getting in touch or scheduling meetings with this particular professor or that uh, office. And so we said, well, let's, let's eliminate the, the middleman, so to speak, the scheduler, and just have it be online. Uh, some, another way that we were able to find efficiency was uh, we had a um, faculty support person uh, retire um, about a year ago. Um, and one of the questions I always ask before, before immediately jumping into a replacement search is, is it necessary to replace this person? Can we think of another way of doing what that person did? And the answer I got back was, well, I don't know. I mean, really what this person did was kept track of student attendance. The professor would pass around a roster, uh, the students would sign in, they would drop it off with the faculty support person, uh, she would log it into a, a, a database, and then we would be able to run reports. We were able to not replace that position by utilizing a software called CourseKey. So the way CourseKey works is every student has an app on their phone. 
the desktop computer in the classroom has uh, a, a similar app. When the professor clicks the button to start class, the computer emits, it can't make this stuff up, a, an inaudible sound. Well, it's inaudible to humans, but the app on the student's phone picks it up and records their attendance. And it's at a frequency, I don't understand all the, the science, but it's at a frequency that it does not pass through walls. So a student can't be sitting outside uh, and reporting their, their attendance that way. That Freeing up that staff position allowed me to take those resources and put them towards something that was, uh, something that was more important, something that was more student uh, facing. In the library, I see lots of opportunities and potential for, uh, for helping us prepare students for the next gen bar exam because we know that research is going to be so, uh, so important. Um, the other way that I think you could be very, very helpful is by understanding the big picture budget. As deans, we do not like surprises. Just the opposite, we love when somebody comes to us and says, you know what, I found a more efficient way of doing something. On the other hand, you have to be careful about saving a few pennies but causing yourself a lot of headaches. So for example, we had made a switch from uh, a big name document signing software to what I would characterize as more of a knockoff brand. Uh, the, we saved a few bucks, which was great, but the emails for those uh, contract signing, which by the way we used for financial aid packaging, would all go to student spam. And the other one wouldn't. And so it created more headaches and so we ended up switching back to the more, uh, the more expensive one. Um, I know we're supposed to, we're required to talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll just say, um, we, we uh, one of my associate deans, my associate dean for students, is at the NALSALP conference right now. It's the National Association of Law Student Affairs Professionals, and they had a uh, topic on answering student nasty grams. You know, like those emails from students are just you know, over, the, over the top. And their suggestion was run it through chat G GPT and have chat GPT draft an initial response uh, for you. So there you go. Um, another example of, of ways that, that we've been able to provide more value for about the same amount of money is with respect to student services. So uh, one, of the things, uh, one of the things we were spending a lot of money on was a relationship with a local hospital to provide student counseling uh, services. Um, we found out that we could provide a greater, more comprehensive set of full medical services. So primary care, specialty care, 24 seven psychiatric and counseling. Uh, support to both faculty, staff, and but primarily students through something called Timely Care, which is a, uh, a telemedicine uh, provider. Uh, and it's been just a complete godsend for students who don't have, uh, have health insurance uh, and who are very comfortable with using technology. We've seen incredible usage rates uh, uh, with it uh, and zero, zero pushback. Uh, the last example I'll give you is uh, one of our uh, law librarians uh, was negotiating to uh, purchase uh, something called Stack Maps. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it uh, for our library because we just moved our library to a, to a new location, and he had the forethought to to ask, well, you know, you can to Stack Maps. Hey, you can do this for the law library, but what about for the rest of the school? Could you, could you do something? And they said, sure, we could do it for an extra price. And, and he actually negotiated to get it for the exact same price uh, for, for, the, the, for the whole law school as for, the, uh, uh, for just the, the law library. And I thought that was a, a, a very, very good approach on his approach. And what I said to him was I wanted to incentivize him to do more thinking like that, so I said, well, I'll remove that from the law library's budget. 
we'll take that on the, the, the law school's budget, and, and, and so you can be incentivized to find other ways uh, to do that. So we're really thinking of ourselves as one law school. So uh, I, I expect the next 10 years will be a time of great change for, for legal education, the enrollment cliff, LSAT optional, a new bar exam, AI, political interference, et cetera. But I'm really confident that this unified approach and an approach that looks to leverage technology uh, will be one of the key ways that, that we will be successful. So uh, thank you, and I think we'll, the three of us will open up to questions now. <laughs> I will put the ILL slip on. <laughs> I want to get yelled at. Back Questions? Somebody has to have a question. Yes? I got some more just an idea. You talked about, you know, you gave those nanograms of having AI write responses. Uh, based on like what we saw this morning, what about instead running those or maybe like feedback on student evaluation forms through through AI before you hand it to the professors as a way to like blunt an emotional interaction there? So be like, wow, that's a great idea. That's a really great idea. So take so I teach evidence to our, our two L's, uh, or half basically half of our two L's. So I could so I could take my evaluations, feed it into Chat GPT or, or another program, ask it to summarize here. What are the what are the three common themes that you see in these evaluations? Th that would that would certainly uh, make the process for me a lot better because you know for those of us who who teach, you know, it just takes that one student response just to get under your skin for you know for a good week but to to look for those patterns that's a really great idea i mean i also wonder maybe if that could help um administ administration because i know one of the concerns of student evaluations is um you know gender and racial bias yep. on behalf of the students and, and what they say and you know how they evaluate professors and i wonder if that's another maybe a side benefit or a way that you know running those through an ai to try and like you know, fil filter, filter out some of that bias. I mean, I don't know if that would, if that would work or, or if it's there yet, but I mean, it, it's big about another use case. Yeah, no, that's great. And actually, thinking of another one, so take all of the evaluations for a school, all courses, all professors, feed them through the program, have the program, what, what are the top, you know, three positive, three negatives that students see across all the different, you know, courses? Um, yeah, so our, our school, we're, we're very known for professor accessibility. Uh, so a professor very, very accessible to students, so I imagine that would be, you know, would be pretty high. Uh, you know, but perhaps a, a negative that might come through, actually I know a negative that comes through is, you know, I wish the professor would post the PowerPoints ahead of time uh, for, for those faculty who don't do that. But I don't know, you, you, you don't. I, I think a tool like that could help us see the forest for the trees. Um, so I, really, really good idea. How do you all do course evaluations since you're not brick and mortar? The link is sent out uh, to students to do an end of the course, end of the term evaluation. Um, so it's not, you know, right. the professor usually hand it on class or yeah. something else. That's not Another department essentially right. sends out a link to students to do an end of term evaluation. And then that's sent back to the dean. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. still find out. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the app you mentioned for student attendance? Course Key. Okay, because we use uh, Quickly. Yeah, th there's a, there are a couple out there. Um, the, the reason why we were attracted to this one was the, the whole sound technology aspect, because uh, I think the, some of the others um, use QR codes and, and, and things like that, which I, I think could work just as uh, could work just as well. And I know there are some LMSs that have attendance taking built in Canvas, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think that um, you know, for us, it was we needed to move beyond the paper and pencil. Are there privacy concerns? With that, like I'm just picturing if you're in a state institution in a state that's not so positive to certain student affinity groups, that it's a way to track students who are meeting on campus. 
for like I mean, is that like something where you give a disclaimer to certain? Yeah, so it's yeah, so it's the the data resides with the software vendor. We just see that you know, the number of absences uh, per class. Um, you know, I, I I don't think there's like is it a proactive thing like the professor has to like <laughs> activate it for the yeah 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 that's the only way it doesn't it doesn't track them sort of in real time. Uh, I mean, you could imagine a software that you know, geofenced this classroom and would know whether you're, that, that's getting a little, little. I mean, it very well could. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's, that's, I think, a good reason. I mean, I know undergraduate institutions do a lot of, big undergraduate institutions will do a lot of tracking based on student swipe cards. So how often are students, and this is going to analyzing retention data, how often are students swiping into the library? How often are students swiping into the gym? Uh, how long are they at the gym versus the library? You know, things, things like that. We, we chose not to go with Course Key because of that reason, actually, what, you, what chose. We, we're also a larger institution that has two law schools, so we also had to consider yeah. undergraduate and graduate. We went with A-plus attendance, which is scanning, QR, uh, instructor, because Canvas is just terrible. Like, okay. yeah, it's, it's pretty basic, um, but yeah. The other thing, the other reason why we were trying to get away from the paper and pencil sign-in oh, yeah. sheet, COVID. Sure. You know, when we were back in person, you know, the thought of... Oh, it started know, right back up after COVID. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you override course key if someone forgets their phone? Yep. Yeah, I mean, so... One of, one of my concerns was, what if a student doesn't have a cell phone? And the vendors basically laughed at me. It's like, <laughs> you're, you're, you know, and they all have, have, have something. But they can also do it from their computer, or to your point, if their battery runs dead, it's just a matter of the uh, professor clicking, uh, clicking the, the button to mark them present. It's very easy. And what was, the, what was the one you used? A, a plus attendance. We're just, we're, we did a pilot. We're just about to go into full implementation in the fall. Okay. But it has scanning, um, you gotcha. know, and code and, and manual input and all the other yeah. things as well. It just didn't have that little big brothery effect that yeah. Course Key did. They have a lot of other products Course Key does, though. They do. They do. They, they do. have a lot. Yeah. We have the, sim we, built, we built one like five years ago. And one of the reasons, like you stated, we lost a position, and half of time for that, that position was just to handle mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And we did one. The reason we built it is because they needed something that pulled students' information and classes from Pathway, which is the system we use, rather than having to do that manually. So we don't want to pay someone else to do that. Yeah. And it has been working fine. I would give, I would give anything to be able to hire a programmer right now to do things well, yeah, like we, we work. We work with. Uh, IT and we pay them, but it's still less than a vendor yeah. because thousands and thousands less than a vendor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah understood. The um, the other thing with attendance, and this goes back to retention uh, as well, is we wanted real time data. So you know, if we get a call <coughs> from a parent, oh, you know, our son and daughter, their grandmother just died. We're trying to get a hold of them or whatever. We can immediately see are they in class. Uh, uh, or not. And from a retention standpoint, our academic support team can see in real time, you know, is that student on academic probation attending class or, or how often are they missing class and reach out to them before they get to the point of having too many absences that they're, they're in real, real trouble. Since, you know, obviously we're all 100% online, so our students distract via Zoom, right. which has the attendance but for those of you who have hybrid programs or doing online, how do you navigate attendance for students who are online? So the system we built, one reason we did that too, because we we tried geolocation and student didn't want, want it, you know. Uh, that's not a tough subject. But, but uh, when you set up the class, you can say this class is in room two and this class is online, and then it won't use the geolocation when it's online. And all they have to do is just type a code or whatever this is the tool they are using. 
A plus has a Teams and Zoom integration, so it actually pulls the data from Zoom and calculates if they came and left 52 times, oh, wow. it will calculate the total time that they're there um, and go into the system. Oh, I may have to look into A+. I know, it's awesome. <laughs> Can I say Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, you made a comment just now that uh, gave me a little pause. You said, I'd give anything to hire a programmer. And um, it's interesting because, so I'm in the position I could think about hiring, but I'm starting to hire uh, expertise instead of people. Because if you only need a programmer for one or two things, I don't need the programmer. Um, so we're, you know, that's one of the things that we're in the position of like, do we really need the person, or could we just use the expertise for seven months? What do you mean? Expertise. Um, going to contact services for certain things like yeah. programming and yeah, you know, I, I, I for a good two years I could put a program a yeah. true program to work because as a standalone school we don't have a university to rely on and there's a lot we could be doing with our student information system uh, that we're not but we need somebody who knows how to write that code to do those those integrations. Yeah, I think we didn't hire a program. Programmer works with IT, and they do other stuff too. This is mm -hmm. like right. one. It's like right. contracting, basically. Yeah. But if I could hire, I will hire a librarian who had programming expertise and can do more than just stuff like yeah. that. Can I work access to justice, build projects, right. build tools? But, yeah. And by the way, that's like I have like ten different roles that I would want to hire for. <laughs> that's not right. necessarily not the, the first, top. Right. But, you know. <laughs> Faculty, more librarians, more <laughs> academic support, etc. I get the last question. Yeah. I'm going to just come back to course key for those advanced uses, ASP tracking, finding the student in real time. Does that presuppose that every faculty member then is using it in class in order to make that work? And do all the faculty use it, or is it optional? Yes, and yes, no. We we did not give them <laughs> the, the choice. Okay. Yeah, and and they've embraced it. They they uh, because. Passing around the attendance sheet was a pain, and collecting it. And what inevitably would happen was students would say, they would email the professor, I forgot to sign into class. And it would just, the, the professors were frustrated, the students were frustrated, the administration was frustrated. Uh, you know, we had, you know, there, there were a lot of kinks that we had to work out uh, in the, the beginning, but uh, it seems to be working pretty well. But we'll continue to evaluate as new vendors come on the, the horizon. I guess that's it. Thank you all again. Yeah, thank you.